Good evening. Welcome to the twice monthly meeting of Westminster's Mayor and Common Council. During the public health crisis, we will be conducting our meetings remotely, and they will be available and streamed live on the city's Facebook page, as well as the community media center. We'll begin as we do every meeting with the pledge of the flag, followed by a moment of silence. Please join me in the pledge. Mm -hmm. Pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. 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 Republic, America. 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 Republic, for which it stands, which it stands. One nation, under God, God. 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 indivisible, with liberty, 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 and justice for all. <clears throat> All right, thank you all. Copy of tonight's agenda and the entire information packet that the council will be using are available online on the city's website for anybody who would like to uh, go there and uh, be able to follow along with that. Uh, the first thing this evening is the consideration of minutes. We have minutes, we have four sets of minutes tonight uh, from uh, previous council meetings. And uh, we will go ahead and take those up. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? The three motion special, to approve. Um, Second. Thank you. Thank you. There's a motion by Mr. Dayhoff, I believe. Yes, sir. And a second by Ms. Gilbert. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes seem to have it, and the ayes have it, and the minutes are approved. Um, Mr. Mayor, I believe you have a proclamation to start us off with. I do. Um, so I have a proclamation here, but before um, I say it, so it's a proclamation uh, declaring June 15th, 2020 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Um, Councilwoman Gilbert would like to, she requests if she could say a few words before I went ahead and, and read it off. Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, for many people, I just kind of wanted to give a little history and a background on um, the proclamation and um, why we have it. So um, the International Committee for the Prevention of Elder Abuse um, established World Elder Abuse Awareness Day in 2006. The day is recognized annually June 15th. Um, the day is recognized in an effort to unite communities around the world in raising awareness about elder abuse. Uh, the day aims to focus global attention on the problem of physical, emotional, and financial abuse of, of all of our elders. It also seeks to understand the challenges and the opportunities presented by our aging population and brings together senior citizens, their caregivers, national and local governments, academics, and the private sector to exchange ideas about how best to reduce incidents of violence toward elders, increasing reporting of such abuse and to develop elder-friendly policies. This year particularly, the Maryland Department of Aging and our local Carroll County Department of Social Services would like to place a focus on elder abuse. As a result of COVID-19, many people have been required to stay at home, as we all know. But as a result, the many community safety nets that are currently that were currently in place have not been present because everybody's been staying at home. So we would like to take a proactive approach and just focus awareness on the fact that many of our elders are victims of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. The first step in elder abuse prevention is awareness. And I want to thank the council and the mayor for the proclamation. And I want the community to know that if they have a concern, to please call the Department of Social Services at 410-386-3434 to report any suspected case. There's a great group of folks um, ready and willing to help our community. But thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Okay, so for the proclamation. Whereas older adults deserve to be treated with respect and dignity to enable them to serve as leaders, mentors, volunteers, and vital participating members of our communities. And in 2006, the International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse in support of the United Nations International Plan of Action proclaimed a day to recognize the significance of elder abuse as a public health and human rights issue. And on June 15, 2020, it recognized as the World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and is intended to promote a better understanding of abuse and neglect of older adults. And the National Center on Elder Abuse and the City of Westminster recognize the importance of taking action to raise awareness, prevent, 
and address elder abuse. And as our population lives longer, we are presented with an opportunity to think about our collective needs and future as a nation. And ageism and so social isolation are major causes of elder abuse in the United States. And it is up to all of us to ensure that proper social structures exist so people can retain community and societal connections, reducing the likelihood of abuse. Now, therefore, I, Joe Dominic, Mayor of the City of Westminster, in conjunction with the Common Council, do proclaim June 15, 2020, as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day in the City of Westminster, and encourage all residents to join the Mayor and Common Council in recognizing and celebrating older adults and their ongoing contributions to the success and vitality of our country and our community. Adopted this eighth day of June, 2020. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thank you, Ms. Gilbert, as well. Um, now move on to uh, approval of the consent calendar. We have two items on the consent calendar this evening. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. All right. There's been a motion from, I think that was Mr. Dayhoff, and it looked like Mr. Cavacci was trying to second, but he couldn't get his mute button off. So we'll take that. I was trying to move, but uh, yeah, I'm talking with my mute button on. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Very, very good. Um, any, uh, um, we'll, go ahead, we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of approval of the consent calendar, signify by saying aye. Aye. You say nay. The yeah, ayes seem to have it and the ayes have it, and the consent calendar is approved. Thank you all very much. Uh, next is a report from the mayor. Mr. Mayor, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, so I have a few things to discuss tonight. <laughs> um, first, I want to talk about some of the work that uh, we've been doing um give you an update on the website since that's going to be a forward-facing piece of communication i want everyone to be up to speed on it um we have uh gotten a, a videographer that's going to be coming out in the coming weeks to take a few shots of um parks and monuments things like that that are around town that um that we know as landmarks here in westminster uh, i bring that up because um we have some time between now and then and if anybody here feels there's something that um, we should include in that. It may or may not make the final cut. That's not up to me. We're going to leave that up to the professional videographer, um, but we'll certainly have, um, we'll put it on the list of shots we want. It's going to be about a 30 second reel. It's just going to be something that's going to be on the homepage of the website, a little nice introduction, but I do think that um, our parks and, and some of the nice uh, landmarks we have around town would be a nice visual for the for the front of the website. And I want everyone to have some input in, in that. Um, and we'll be moving on to the design phase of the of the web design this week uh, with a meeting with our project manager. Um, so I also want to talk about the planning of um, uh, a procession for uh, graduating seniors. So it looks like we've worked out um, a plan for that. I've been uh, in discussion with um, uh, boosters at Westminster High School who are in communications with the with their equivalent organization at Winters Mill. Um, of course, all of the high schools in the Westminster area are invited to it. Those are the two, the two big ones, and um, they have a network to communicate that out. But um, I've been working with them, um, our clerk, Mr. Visoxi, and our, uh, our chief of police, um, Chief Ludwell, and they, they've uh, turned in a permit for the week of, they have a requested date for the week of the 14th through the 20th. There's a date in there. Um, now, I don't know if that date's been approved um, well, with or without alteration. Uh, Chief Fledwell, um, the date that was on that permit, is that going to work for us in the time? No. <laughs> Of Chief Lowell when, when he's when he can chime in on that. Um, they did submit a date and time today, so that happened today. Um, and so I just wanted to say, you know, it, it looked okay, but uh, the time of day may, you know, whether or not it's going to cause traffic issues. The the next step is the chief is going to um, create a route um, that the procession is going to it's going to go, and then um, and then we're going to get that information to the boosters, and we're going to have a procession for graduating seniors. Um, obviously, it's not ideal. They're not going to have the graduation that all the rest of us had, unfortunately. But um, I think this was a, uh, a I think this is a, it's the best we can do, and I think um, I think it'll give them something. Um, and I, when we find out what the route is, if there's a if there's a good place to be, um, I will I, I'm going to um, you know, try to be there and. 
think um, any, any of the council that would like to be there and maybe greet some of the seniors, if we can make, have a little bit of a presence. Maybe we were in one spot, maybe we're all scattered out. Maybe the procession is gonna go by one of our houses and you don't have to go anywhere. You just put a launcher out front. But I think it'd be nice to, to, to show some support if we can. Um, and as we get details, um, we're moving fast on this. Um, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep everyone up, up, up to date. Um, so the next item, and I think it's probably on everybody's mind at this point now that, um, you know, the state's in, in the phase two, and this is, I guess this is, you know, my entire report, except for the first piece, really kind of goes right into the COVID-19 update. Um, they tend to be the, be one and the same these days. Uh, but I, um, but you know, we, we're, we've been talking about uh, transitioning city staff back to normal or a more normal schedule um, and getting things back to, back to, uh, um, you know, all services, uh, full swing. Um, obviously it's gonna be up to departments um, to uh, give us some feedback in, in, in how we need to, you know, maybe alter some procedures, um, you know, for safety purposes and, 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 and so forth. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been talking to uh, Council President Pecorero and Ms. Matthews, and uh, Ms. Matthews has been in touch with some of the, um, or the department heads, and we will have a plan um, this week that we'll, we'll push out to everybody for feedback and suggestions and we'll go you know we'll go from there but we, we expect to you'll have that done this week and um and then we can we can start to implement it um you know right away so that's um that's all i have for my comments mr president unless anyone any of the council have any questions for anything that i said um it's back to you all right thank you mr mayor Did anybody have any questions for the mayor Hearing none, we'll keep moving along then. Um, the uh, next item on the agenda is the COVID-19 pandemic update. And for more details on that, we'll turn to Ms. Matthews, our city administrator. Ms. Matthews. Thank you, President Pat Carrero. Um, I just have uh, one item this evening that I wanted to share with the mayor and common council. Um, on April 29th, the city submitted its plan to Carroll County for reimbursement under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, commonly referred to as the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act provides for payments to state, local, and tribal governments um, called the Coronavirus Relief Fund, or CRF, to navigate the impact of the COVID-19 outbreak. Any local governments in Carroll County, including Westminster, um, had the opportunity to submit their COVID-19 related uh, expenses as part of Carroll County's overall plan that the county then submitted to the state, um, which once again, we did on April 29th. On May 26th, County Administrator Roberta Windham informed me that the county's CRF plan was approved and it has received um, the monies it was seeking. It's my understanding that Westminster submitted expenses, which by my count total about $125,000, uh, will be paid in full. And this coming Friday, Ms. Palmer, our Director of Finance and Administrative Services and I have a virtual meeting with the county's grant manager to discuss the next steps in that process. I'm, I'm aware that one of the steps that we will have to uh, follow is the execution of a subrecipient agreement with the county. Um, so I'll you know, provide you an update after Ms. Palmer and I do have that virtual meeting on Friday. But I guess the bottom line is it looks like we'll be getting about $125,000 um, under the coronavirus relief fund. And I would like to take this opportunity before I close out my report um, to thank all the department heads who submitted expense information, but particularly I'd like to give a shout out to Chief Ludwell, who took the lead in pulling all that information together from the various departments um, and putting it in the format that the county had requested. Um, so that concludes my report. I don't know if uh, Chief Ludwell, if there's anything you'd like to add, I guess our um, outdoor facilities, skate park, and um, some of our other facilities have basically been open not quite a month. And perhaps you could share with the mayor and common council what you and your officers are encountering in terms of compliance. Sure, so our uh, compliance has been very, very good. Um, that uh, We have very few uh, citizen generated calls or complaints and our checks have been um, almost uh, completely uh, finding that individuals are following what they're supposed to do. Uh, businesses seem to be setting up in, in the manner that they're supposed to set up in. So um, it's been pretty good. 
Thank you, Chief. And perhaps Mr. Depot, our Director of Community Planning and Development, might want to make a couple of comments about his department's work on um, expanding outdoor dining opportunities. Do we have updated the city webpage to provide an outline as to what businesses need to do to do outdoor dining and seating? Um, we provided uh, detail uh, processes for them and also guidelines that we're looking at them to do for that outdoor seating. We coordinated with the liquor board um, as well. They are asking for the same type of sketch plan that we are asking for. And they are also asking for barriers around the um, seating area if you are serving alcohol. And again, we were consistent with that, with the guidelines we provided. We also um, provided a simplified site plan application and an updated sidewalk use permit for the temporary outdoor seating. Um, also provided on the webpage for people to use and fill out. And we have waived the fees for those two applications. So we're open. Um, we're going to start reaching out to some restaurants that I think are operating right now and uh, just coordinate with them as well. Uh, but it is up on the web page today. Thank you. And I think President Pecker, that concludes staff's report on this issue. We'd certainly be happy to answer any questions that the Mayor and Common Council may have. Thank you, Ms. Matthews, and thank you to the staff. I did have one question. Could you clarify for us what the situation is in terms of the remaining park facilities that we had not yet acted to reopen, like the pavilions and the playgrounds and things like that. We were at the time, I think, to some extent, waiting on a little more guidance from the governor and also from the um, health department about what, what was permissible and what could be done. Uh, do you have, does anybody have an update for us on where all that stands? As of uh, now, um, the pavilions, um, the playgrounds remain closed. Um, that will be um, some of the issues that we're reviewing as part of the uh, reopening transition plan that the mayor mentioned under his report, and hopefully we'll have more information. Uh, Chief Ludwell, can please correct me if I'm mistaken, but I do believe for outdoor recreation facilities, are we still required, Chief, to circle back around with Mr. Singer, the health officer for Car Carroll County, if we were to go to open our basketball courts and things of that nature. Yes, I believe the section of the executive order that, that deals with public parks uh, does require you to contact the county health officer and uh, run your plan by him. Thank you. Uh, as you look at this, I think you know, looking at those pavilions is a good idea. I mean, it, doesn't seem to me to be a lot of difference between those and, and a lot of the outdoor dining that's taking place at the restaurants. This is what kind of sparked my, you know, my question. So yeah, I think that's just you know, worth taking a look at to see how quickly we can um, make those available to people as well. But uh, that was it. I mean, I'm not saying we should do it tomorrow. Just, you know, let's take a look at that one as well. We would be happy to do so. Thank you. Anybody else have anything from Ms. Matthews or the rest of the staff? Um, Mr. President? Mr. Uh, yes, I just have a question, um, and I'm not sure who to direct it to, Ms. Matthews, or um, or maybe our Parks and Rec. I'm kind of just curious um, where the status on the outdoor fitness is. I know there was some some communication with that, and I believe it was our last meeting we talked a little bit about um, outdoor fitness. So I was just trying to figure out where we were um, for our own gym and also um, those other facilities that may want it to use our play, our um, parks and or parking lots, kind of where are we on that? I can certainly start in the Ms. Gruber, please feel free to, to jump in if there's anything you'd like to add. In terms of our, um, our own Recreation Parks Department offering classes, um, we're very close. Um, Councilmember Gilbert, so um, earlier today, Ms. Gruber provided a some suggested language um, to post on ActiveNet. Uh, basically, it's sort of a waiver. Um, the one we have currently is addressing the fitness center. Mm -hmm. um, that was reviewed by the city attorney and her suggested edits um, were returned to um, Ms. Gruber. Um, we that should suffice um and then we'll probably be we're within a week of basically starting those classes that are offered um by our own recreation and parks department um i've been in touch with one um you know 
business in town um, who had expressed some interest. I think you all are aware of that business because I believe the mayor had shared that email. Um, who had um, reached out about requesting use of a city parking lot. We don't have a formal application process or anything of that nature that's prepared yet. Um, but basically, I've been working um, with that business to find out what their specific requirements are um, and trying to find a location that meets their needs. Um, our insurance carrier legit um, you know, has, re has recommended in those cases that we get certificates of insurance um, from the business um, that will be using our parking facilities, um, whether that's a retail business or a fitness club, um, as well as perhaps some type of waiver. Um, so we're kind of working out those details. But once again, I think we're within a week of being able to kind of make all that happen. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Gruber, is there anything you'd like to add, Ms. Gruber? I want to make sure Abby has the chance to say anything that she'd like to add. Sure. I actually just wanted to add, I believe we're waiting for the feedback on the release of liability from legit. And Ms. LeVan provided us with feedback today on the revised um, Family Fitness Center contract. So I just want to make sure that I'm correct that we haven't heard back from legit yet on the actual um, release that needs to go on ActiveNet for our outdoor fitness classes. Um, Ms. Childs can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe um, Brian DeMay, who is our safety and risk coordinator, um, did hear about it from Legit later this afternoon. I'm not sure that information may have made its way to you, Ms. Gruber, but Ms. Childs, is that correct? That is correct. They suggested adding some wording to cover for the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which we are working on and should have tomorrow. Okay. That sounds great. So I'll await that email and we'll go from there. All right, great. Um, we'll move on now, if there are no further questions, to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. I'll move on now to um, the portion of standing committee. We'll begin with the Arts Council, Mr. Deha. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> The Arts Council gift shop and the uh, the box open reopened on uh, uh, June 3rd um, under a series of COVID-19 guidelines. Um, if you go to the Arts Council's website, it's an excellent website. Um, there is a reopening survey that folks can take and that would help in, in some of the planning um, that's uh, taking place over at the, um, at the Arts Council. Uh, if you go to the website, there are calendars that are available um, to help support uh, the Arts Council and to keep you informed and up to date as to what's occurring over there. And they have begun um, renovations, renovations of the uh, the theater area, um, and we're really excited. Uh, we're really excited about that and looking forward to uh, a successful outcome of that. That'll be my report, unless there's any questions, Mr. President. Very good, thank you. Okay, Bob, um, no questions as far as I know. I'll move on to Economic and Community Development Committee, Mr. Yingling. Yeah, so I wanted to actually touch on what Mr. Depo talked about with the outdoor dining, because we did discuss that. I believe it was an emergency meeting called by the mayor and myself on May 29th, right after the governor uh, initiated phase two. Uh, I wanted to shed some light on kind of what the mentality is of the city uh, in a couple areas. So first off, um, being safe, lawful, but flexible for these restaurants. So uh, we thought that that was really important that if the restaurant brought us an idea, you know, we would at least try to be, as long as it's safe and lawful, we want to be flexible with them. Uh, simplicity in the process and clear in the process, which I just looked over the uh, uh, the, uh, document on the website, which it seems like Mr. Depot succeeded in that. Thank you for that. Uh, and then the fee waivers, which Mr. Depot talked on. The The other part was that the planning uh, office is uh, going to reach out to the restaurants to gauge the interest of first, you know, outdoor dining in general, side, on sidewalks, parking lots, and then street closures, because as the committee discussed, you know, why close the street? Nobody's interested in actually doing it. So I guess my 
follow up for Mr. Depot is what has the response of the restaurants been? What kind of interest um, have they, they relayed to you all? Um, we did put together a survey um, and sent it out to restaurants asking those questions, whether they would be interested in us closing the streets completely or portions of Main Street, closing just the, um, the parking spaces, I'm sorry, the parking spaces themselves for, for pedestrian traffic. Um, so we did get some responses back, I believe up to seven at this point. Um, I'll reach out to Sandy tomorrow to see if I can get a better understanding of how many have responded. I think we we're waiting for um, 10 responses back and we can provide everybody with an update as to what those responses are. We also provided the survey to the chamber. Um, I'm not sure if, um, if they've circulated that uh, survey, but we can check on that as well. But I'm sorry, I just don't have, at this time, I just don't know what the um, actual outcome of the surveys are, but we can certainly put that together for you quickly. Yeah. I, I think that persistency with, you know, reaching out to the restaurants because they're, they, you know, one, one email, they'll, they're likely to kind of glaze by. So I think, you know, really being proactive with them and getting their feedback is going to be helpful. So just, you know, whoever in your department, tell them that, you know, really keep on those restaurants to say, hey, what can we do here uh, to help you? And, and thank you. And Sandy has been doing that. She's been calling the restaurants themselves. Um, any restaurant we see with activity occurring, um, we're going to have her reach out to them as well, just to let them know we do have guidelines and procedures in place. Um, so uh, she has been in steady contact, at least with the downtown restaurants. The next step is to look outside the downtown and start coordinating with the restaurants throughout the uh, city. Thank you. And I have a question as well about the simplified site plan to use parking lots. Um, what does that really entail? Is it essentially, is it just kind of a drawing of what they'd like to do? It, it does. For the most part, anything um, outside of downtown, larger shopping centers will have a site plan already approved at some point for development. So it's really just taking that site plan and drawing on it to where the outdoor seating would be. Uh, demonstrating where the barriers would be and showing that it still allows for vehicular traffic um, and vehicles to park outside of that uh, parked area. So again, we're looking at hand-drawn, simple sketch plans. We don't want people to incur the cost of engineering or anything like that at all. And we will certainly reach out and work with them. And we did do that with Brock Salt and provided a sketch plan um, following what they submitted. So we, we will work with them uh, to get these things through. But that sounds like a job well done. So thank you, Mr. Depot, to your entire department. And that concludes my report. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, move on to the Finance Committee. Um, don't have anything to report myself other than the fact that we uh, you know, have continued to work on um, managing through some of the budget issues that have cropped up over the last few weeks. And I'm pleased that we are now, I think, in a position to finally adopt the um, city's budget for the coming fiscal year. Uh, thanks to the staff who've done so much good work and also to uh, my colleagues on the committee, Mr. Yingling and, of course, the mayor. I think, uh, you know, the other council members have also had a lot of input this year and it's been very helpful. So I'm looking forward to getting that behind us tonight. I know that uh, given the uh, economic uh, impacts of the um, pandemic, we will certainly have adjustments to make because the state will make adjustments, the county may make adjustments, we may see issues that pop up in terms of our revenues and things like that, but we'll do those in the regular order as we move forward, but for at least for tonight, we will get the budget adopted, so I'm very pleased about that. Uh, personnel committee, Ms. Gilbert. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, nothing to report. All right, thank you very much. Um, public safety, Mr. Cavacci. Just a couple of brief uh, things, Mr. President. Number one, um, you know, looking at the crime statistic reports, the, the numbers are still definitely lower um, consistently as I've been reporting pretty much since this whole thing started. Um, it struck me, for instance, one of the, one of the um, categories is DWIs and uh, they're down like something like 90% uh, 
I think, at least over this last period um, compared to last year. So there's been, I guess, some positive that's come out of this in, in that regard. Um, I also wanted to take a moment and just uh, make a comment relative to some feedback I received with the job that our police department's doing um, relative to the protests, particularly um, or demonstrations, I guess, that were taking place downtown on Saturday. We had three of them take place in a relatively short period of time and things went very well. Um, we had no, no real issues um, and a number of business owners reached out to me to compliment the job that they're doing. Um, they, they specifically talked about how they're handling things very well. Um, um, and I wanted to thank them for that. I also just, I guess, wanted to, not that there's probably very many people listening or watching, but I also think we owe the, the citizens a, a, a gratitude as well. You know, they're out there making a statement like they have every right to do. Um, that the First Amendment guarantees them, yet they're doing it in a fashion that is peaceful. Um, I think they're they're making their point without um, putting us in a situation where it becomes really problematic for, for, for downtown. So I'm grateful for that, for anyone that may be listening to this um, from a public safety perspective. Thank you very much for comporting yourself in the way that you are. Um, that is it. Everything else that I plan on talking about was already discussed relative to public safety. So that's all I have, Mr. President. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Kavachi. Public Works, Mr. Yingling. Nothing to report. All right. Very good. Recreation and Parks, Mr. Dehoff. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we had a meeting on uh, May the 28th, and we took a good look at the uh, uh, restructuring the uh, the family uh, center's uh, budget adjustments. Uh, we also looked at um, improvements to the pool. Um, I think the only follow-up item on that, Mr. President, is uh, we want to take a look at updating uh, Chapter 175 of the city code to implement the new family center and the pool fees. and. I think that's going to go over to uh, finance, the finance committee. You're going to meet on that sometime soon, Mr. President? We are indeed. Okay, 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 okay. Um, I think that might be it. Oh, um, I guess I wanted to follow up on um, to use, uh, to take advantage of um, uh, the time that we, we have these days to follow up on the, the February the 5th meeting. Um, um, and see where we are with the uh, POS money for Wakefield Valley and where that where that grant administration is uh, to take a look at some design and some master plan uh, over at Wakefield Valley. And we'll, we'll look forward to hearing a report on that at some time soon. Um, Councilwoman Gilbert, do you have any follow up on that? Any of this? Um, the only thing, thank you. Um, and the only thing, I'm sorry, I didn't even think about it um, and I'm not sure if I missed it or um, if there is a follow-up. The basketball nets and the playgrounds, is that in the works this week? Is that what Mr. Mayor, you said, or did I miss that totally? Well, Gilbert, so if you're addressing me, um, the basketball courts, um, so some of it's up to us, some of it's not. Um, we we have to, um, we, we submit a plan to uh, Carroll County um, Health Department and when we did that, we asked them, um, we kind of sent them a preliminary plan with what we with what was on the table. And we were told at that time that um, we should not include basketball courts because it likely would not be approved. Um, so that is coming from the, the county level. I believe, I believe playgrounds were our call. And um, I'm, I'm unsure about pavilions. I don't remember if that was our call, if that was something the, the, the health department. Um, you know, told us we, we can or cannot open, but we, we do have to, um, you know, our, our policies have to fall within the policies um, that come down from the Carroll County Health Department. Yeah, I believe that was with that stage one opening. So I was wondering if that mm -hmm. had changed or I don't know, maybe this is, this is probably more council comment and discussion than Parks and Rec Committee. So I apologize, but it popped in my head. Um, so I didn't know if that was, Mr. President, shall I just wait and move back to council comments and discussion? Well, or, uh, I, I, would, I would just suggest, Ms. Gilbert, that I think Ms. Matthews reported earlier that they are taking a look at all these things this week, and um, I'm sure that um, 
that's going to be part of it. And okay. I think they've got to have some interaction with the health department. So I'm sure okay. that as she goes through with those discussions, she'll be reporting back to us this week because I think everybody understands that we're, you know, at this point, you know, we're happy to open up things for our citizens when we can. So <laughs> that's the part, that's the answer. I, I didn't quite catch whether they were included and in all that. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on then uh, to um, uh, council comments and discussion. Uh, we'll go around the group. I will start, Mr. Cavacci. Anything you'd like to uh, share this evening? Um, one brief thing, Mr. President. I'd like to take a moment and thank Ms. Matthews and Mr. Depot and the, any other staff that may have been involved. We had um, a business reach out uh, looking for some assistance in a way to hold an event that they have regularly, but their facility would not accommodate it, given the um, you know state requirements on what businesses can and can't do in terms of numbers and distancing and things like that. Um, they they have uh, requested to to use a, a, a you know piece of city property. Miss Matthews was incredibly responsive, jumped right on top of it. Um, Mr. Depot, obviously, I'm sure played a role in that as well. The business is very happy. Um, you know, it goes in, in uh, I think, sync with what, uh, you know, was reported earlier relative to the restaurants. And like Mr. Yingling was saying, you know, we want to try to be flexible and help these folks as much as possible. And uh, I'm grateful that, you know, uh, staff jumped on that and got it done quickly. And I, I'm sure as time goes on, we'll probably have more of that to come. But I just wanted to say thank you. Um, publicly for a job well done. That's it, Mr. President. Well, thank you, Mr. Gavachi. Uh, and uh, we'll go to Mr. Deha. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I've also gotten really great feedback on the, the work on the outdoor dining, and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, I also wanted to share that um, I found it really rewarding. I wanted to echo some of the remarks that were made earlier. Um, I found it really rewarding to work with the folks um, that have rallied for social justice at the library uh, for the last week. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, by all reports, they've been well received. Uh, this is what democracy looks like. Um, hopefully by now folks have come to understand that under the leadership of Chief Ledwell, uh, we have an awesome police department, and the city of Westminster has been in the customer service business. And uh, I think it's important for everyone to understand that uh, the city of Westminster is an open and affirming community, and that we're dedicated to constantly rolling up our sleeves to make things better. Um, public works. Um, I took a tour of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, last Friday, as I'm sure folks are aware that I was chair of the Environmental Affairs Advisory Board with the county back in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, I was pretty impressed that um, that when we finish up with that plant, we're going to have a, a plant that's environmentally state-of-the-art within the limits of technology. And um, Mr. President, if it's okay with you, I think um, I think the last <laughs> comprehensive report that the Public Works Director did uh, for the um, for the, um, um, for the wastewater treatment plant upgrade uh, was before the last election. It was before last May. If, if it would be okay with you, um, maybe we could uh, uh, schedule some time after we get past the budget and some of these other things uh, so that the public works director could give us another update um, on what we're doing with the wastewater treatment plant because um, it's really exciting. And um, I think, um, I think we ought to let the let folks know um, what we're accomplishing down there. Um, right, good suggestion. Uh, we've been focused on a number of other things right. in the last several weeks that demanded our attention, but uh, good time to uh, you know take a look at that and catch up on where we are. So we will uh, work with the staff to uh, schedule that. And, and one other thing, if it's okay with you, Mr. President, um, I still would love to take a good look at the um, um, our um, at, at the city code when it comes to, to parking and and signage downtown. It seems to be a little bit of a mishmash, and it would be great if we could clean that up. And I had a little bit of a conversation with uh, the the planning director just recently, and uh, I know he's up for it. So maybe we can look forward to uh, to that as an initiative that we can we can start cleaning up uh, the city code just a little bit. 
Um, I think that will be all for right now, Mr. President. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Dayhoff. Um, Ms. Gilbert, anything you'd like to add? All right, thank you very much. Mr. Yingling. I have nothing to add this evening, thank you. All right, thank you. So in that case, we will move on to um, ordinances, of revolu ordinances and resolutions. And um, the first on our agenda tonight is uh, adoption of ordinance number 922, an ordinance of the mayor and common council, Westminster, Maryland, approving and adopting a budget for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2020, and ending June 30th, 2021. Ms. Matthews. Thank you, President Pecorero. Um, I think as the group knows, we've uh, covered a lot of ground since this ordinance was introduced on April 27th. Um, included in your agenda packet uh, is a staff memo summarizing the changes that have been made to the ordinance um, since its introduction on April 27th. The majority of those changes are certainly familiar to the mayor and common council as they were modifications to the initial budget uh, that you specifically directed over the course of the budget review process. Um, and then there's a few items that involve new information that staff received just within the last few weeks. Uh, certainly staff would be happy to answer any questions you all have, but in the interest of time, I won't walk through every change that's been made to ordinance number 922 since its introduction. However, there are a handful of items that I did wanna highlight for you all this evening. Um, as was mentioned during the committee report, uh, both the Finance Committee and the Recreation and Parks Committee reviewed the plan developed by Ms. Gruber to eliminate the fitness center operating deficit. The amended version of the ordinance that is before you this evening reflects Ms. Gruber's projected revenues for FY 2021 under that plan, assuming a full year of fitness center operations. Uh, since the Finance Committee and the Recreation and Parks Committee uh, met with Ms. Gruber virtually, of course, to discuss her plan, um, Ms. Palmer, Ms. Childs, and I have been working to refine the FY 2021 budget personnel uh, projections, particularly in light of the new Phase 3 implementation plan, the Compensation and Classification Study. Uh, that process was actually not completed until Friday afternoon, um, and at the completion of that process, we did note that fitness center personnel expenditures were projected to be slightly higher than that that was envisioned in the plan that Ms. Graber did share with the committee. Um, so I did want to call to your attention that the version of ordinance number 922 that is in your agenda packet reflects a slight fitness center operating deficit of approximately $19,000 in FY 2021. Ms. Palmer and I don't consider this amount to be material to the overall FY 2021 budget. And there are certainly a number of factors that could easily eliminate it, including the possibility of an alternative insurance election and that assumed once Ms. Gruber has the opportunity to fill a vacant position. And I think we would all recognize that there's considerable uncertainty surrounding when we're even going to reopen the fitness center. Ms. Palmer and I did feel, however, given all the discussion that you've had about this matter, um, that it was important to call the approximately $19,000 budgeted um, operating deficit to your attention. Also, as we were working to refine and recalculate our personnel cost, um, one of the things that uh, was the end result of that process is that the general fund is calculated at this time to have a surplus, which will positively impact the fund's reserve balance. As you know, we have anticipated a decline in certain revenue sources due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so if the surplus um, ends up holding to be true, that would certainly provide a beneficial cushion for us as we sort of navigate these uncertain waters. And then lastly, two other items that were called out in the memo, um, but really just developed within the last week or so. One is that the city uh, recently received correspondence from the State Highway Administration updating its highway user revenue projections for both fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021. Projections for both fiscal years were reduced by FHA with a change of 89,000 in the negative direction for FY 2021. And that, that was noted in the staff memo included in your agenda packet. Lastly, uh, we did receive notification um, just last week um, from the state that we have been awarded a community parks and playground 
grant in the amount of $75,000 for a climbing structure installation at the Tahoma Road Boulder Park. Um, and I did want to have to take this opportunity to congratulate Ms. Gruber on yet another successful grant application. So once again, staff would be more than happy to answer any questions you have um, regarding the amended budget ordinance that is before you this evening. Um, Ms. Palmer, as she worked on the ordinance, did note um, the various changes. And President Pecker, I do just want to make sure from a procedural standpoint that everyone is just aware that there will be, um, we do need a motion to amend ordinance number 92 to incorporate the changes that are highlighted uh, in the version of the ordinance that's included in your agenda packet uh, once there has been a motion to amend on the Common Council and its discretion can vote on the amended ordinance. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Matthews. Let's start with that then. Um, may I have a motion to amend uh, and as referenced in the um, documents you have before you? Mr. President, I'll move to amend ordinance number 922. Thank you, Mr. Cavacci. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. There's been a motion and a second uh, and to amend um, ordinance 922 to reflect those uh, changes presented by staff. Um, and is there any further discussion on the on the discussion on the amendment itself, which are of course the uh, things that Ms. Matthews mentioned? Um, Mr. President, I just have a question, just to double check. Um, Ms. Gilbert, Ms. Matthews, if I am not mistaken, um, the Parks and Rec, the budget, um, that um, fitness center was, the budget was based on a 20% attrition on fitness center fitness center memberships. Is that not correct? Uh, you um, are correct, Council Member Gilbert. Okay. So, um, and that was, that was probably that 20%, we really don't know what COVID-19 is gonna do to the, to the fitness center idea. Um, and what that return is, but that's probably um, a, a pretty safe attrition. So if we have a little less, that the uh, the deficit would would then also be less. Correct. That is correct, and that's why I was going to say, um, Ms. Palmer and I, when we realized you know where things shook out, it was obviously Friday afternoon. Um, as you pointed out, we could have a much more positive um, experience in terms of membership attrition. I think Ms. Gruber was you know, appropriately conservative with her 20%. Um, also the city's budgeting practice has been when we have a vacant position, um, we assume that that employee um, will elect family coverage um, for you know, health, dental, and vision. Um, so that's the most conservative approach to take. Um, if that employee, when Ms. Gruber has the opportunity to hire someone, um, elects individual coverage, that in and of itself is a large enough swing that it could practically wipe out the entire number, just that factor alone. Okay. And, so that's one. One. okay. Thank you. I have one. Go ahead. Um, and then Ms. Matthews, um, because of COVID-19 and all the restrictions, and I know we're, we're now on June 8th, um, if the gym can't open fiscally, or I guess if the gym cannot open, say as of July 1st, does that a kind of affect the budget if we would have to furlough employees or kind of where does that play out? Play, how does that play out? That's an excellent question, Council Member Gilbert. And Ms. Gruber and I've had some initial discussions regarding that matter. Um, since the Rec and Parks Committee and the Finance Committee, um, and I think by that point it covered pretty much everyone but Council Member Kovacci in one of the committee meetings. Um, we are at this juncture, um, which I think is what you're alluding to, um, the benefited fitness center staff are still on payroll. So um, if the fitness center does not open on July 1st, which I think all of us recognize as a very real possibility at this juncture, um, and those staff you know, remain on payroll, um, then basically we're sort of working in the, the negative direction financially. Um, so I think that's an issue that we'll probably want to talk to you about, um, you know, within the next few weeks. But, you know, the budget does anticipate um, there's really no other way for Ms. Gruber to do what she needed to do, given all the uncertainty that she doesn't bulk, but to assume a full year of operations, both on the expense side and on the revenue side. Um, at this juncture, we obviously are not charging people to use a facility that they can't use, and we still do have a portion of that expense that we're carrying at this time. And certainly, Ms. Gruber and 
um, her staff are all obviously doing everything possible to, you know, to do protective work. Um, through no fault of those employees, they just happen to work for a facility that's closed at this time. And and Ms. Matthews, when should we we pretty much meet and address that so that we can do it in a timely manner? I know we're we're at June eighth, so. Um, I think if you all have any thoughts about that this evening that you'd like to share, those I'm sure Ms. Gruber would welcome those as well. Um, alternatively, you know, this is you know could be viewed as part of the transition plan um, that we've been talking about earlier this evening in terms of most of our discussion has focused on reopening. Obviously, the flip side of that is there are certain um, aspects of our operation, specifically the fitness center, that we can't open. So I think that can be part of that same conversation, um, if that's acceptable to the mayor and common council. Thank you. I, I would just add, clearly it's a conversation we've already begun, you know, across the board in a lot of different things. And, you know, we're still waiting for, to learn more about factors that are beyond our control. And uh, you know, those things change on a daily basis. So I think we're just gonna have to continue to you know, have some conversations over the next several days, a couple of weeks, and um, it'd be ready to make a decision here, I think, in the near future if uh, we don't see any likelihood that uh, the status of the fitness center is going to be able to change you know, very quickly. So. Mr. President. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, did you want to say something? I would just like to say that I think the best we can do in this situation and many others uh, so that when we do get new information, we can act quickly is basically just set up a, a series of, well, you're going to hear the, you know, the software developer come out, I mean, the if then rules, you know. Um, because we don't know what the governor and the state's going to do. We don't know those things. But I think it is good that we have a plan um, or multiple plans based on when that stuff happens. Because, um, you know, kind of like the, the, the restaurant situation, um, phase two opened up a little sooner than I expected the governor to do so. And so, we, you know, we, we, we had to call a meeting and then we had to, you know, get everything together. And we probably could have been a few days ahead of that if we um, had anticipated that. And since we can't really, totally anticipate those things. I think, you know, maybe we sit down and we come up with rules. Um, if, you know, if, if by this date, this is an open, we can do that with our, um, you know, with, uh, we've kind of already set that up with our, with our events. Um, we have, at least we have a, a, or somewhat of a calendar um, of when we would need to make the final decision. Um, and that, and that's, we can do something similar with that with the fitness center. I think that's, that's really all we can do, but it, it will allow us um, to make faster decision action take faster action once things can or you know cannot open it'll it'll simplify the process once we get news we don't have to call them advertise it wait 24 48 hours and then and then hold it um, we can we can be prepared for that that's it All right, thank you mr mayor any further discussion on uh, the amendment give me none perhaps we can move on to a vote uh if you're ready all those in favor of approving the amendment uh, that incorporates staff recommendations, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The ayes seem to have it and the ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. We now move on to discussion of the main motion itself, ordinance 922. Is there any additional discussion on the budget ordinance? I think we've had lots over the last few weeks. I think anybody else has anything else they'd like to bring up? Hearing nothing, I'll assume that we are ready for the vote. Uh, all those in favor of adopting ordinance number 922, the city's budget for the coming fiscal year, uh, signify by saying aye. Mr. President, I think we need a motion and a second first, don't we? Um, well, I'm not. All right, well, we'll take one just in case. But I think we already had, I think we assumed that there was an underlying motion since we had the amendment. Okay. Um, I don't want to question your procedures. You're better at it than me. So just wanted to make sure we didn't miss it. Well, we will, uh, without objection, uh, the question before the council is adoption of ordinance number 922 as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes seem to have it and the ayes have it and ordinance 922 is adopted. Thank you all very much uh, for uh, getting us through this. And now uh, the next uh, item on the agenda is for introduction only of ordinance number 923, an ordinance, of the, an ordinance of the Common Council of the Mayor and Common Council of Westminster, Municipal Corporation of the State of Maryland, 
uh, the issuer providing for the issuance and sale of an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $1,225,000 of bonds of the issuer to be known as the Mayor and Common Council of Westminster Infrastructure Bonds 2020 Series A or by such other or additional designation or designations as required by the Community Development Administration identified herein. The bonds to be issued and sold pursuant to the authority of sections 4-101 through 4-255 of the Housing and Community Development Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland as amended for the purpose of one, financing or refinancing costs of the project identified herein as the Westminster Community Pool Improvements Project, two, funding of portion of a capital reserve fund and or other reserves, and or three, paying issuance and other costs related to the bond, providing that the bond shall be issued upon the full faith and credit of the issuer, providing for the disbursement of the proceeds of the sale of the bonds and for the levy of annual taxes upon all accessible property within the corporate limits of the issuer for the payment of the principal of and interest on the bonds as they shall respectively come due, providing for the form, tenor, denominations, maturity date, or dates and other provisions of the bond, providing for the sale of the bonds and providing for related purposes, including without limitation, the method of fixing the interest rate or rates to be borne by the bonds, the approval, execution and delivery of documents, agreements, certificates and instruments, and the making of or providing for the making of representations and covenants concerning the tax status of interest on the bond. Um, Ms. Matthews, is this going to be you or uh, Ms. Rader or who? Uh, Ms. Rader, our bond council, will be providing the staff report for this item. Hi, right, thank you. Ms. Rader? Good evening, Mayor Dominic, uh, Common Council President Pecoraro, and members of the Common Council. Let me start by just a perhaps a housekeeping matter. I noticed that the agenda refers to the ordinance number as 923, but the ordinance included in your packages is actually numbered 924. So I don't know if we need to make a motion just to correct the ordinance um, number on as it is introduced. Um, I don't know which is correct. Ms. Viskowski, can you tell us which would be correct? Um, I believe the, the version that you had, um, President Pecker, was the correct version. That is correct. It, it, it is 924 because 923 was the plastic bag ordinance. Or my apologies okay. for that. All right, thank you. So then without objection, the um, ordinance uh, as introduced is amended to be ordinance number 924. Thank you, Ms. Rader. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, turning to the, the guts of the ordinance, um, the Maryland Community Development Administration, which I'll refer to as CEA, runs a program known as the Local Government Infrastructure Program. CDA issues revenue bonds to the public market and uses proceeds of those bonds to make loans to participating uh, Maryland counties, municipalities, and other governmental entities um, in order to finance projects that qualify as infrastructure project. The city has, in recent years, participated in pooled programs with other borrowers in 2012 and 2017. And in 2019, the city participated in a standalone financing through CDA for the broadband fiber project. Um, this uh, ordinance relates solely to financing for the Westminster Community Pool Improvements Program. Everybody talks in terms of CDA making loans to its participants, but the way the city evidences or papers alone is by issuing a general obligation bond or bonds to CDA. Uh, the ordinance provides that the, max the maximum principal amount of the bonds that may be issued for purposes of this project, including to fund both pool improvement costs, fund any reserves, and cover costs of issuance, is $1,225,000. Now that amount can be reduced by the city in terms of the actual amount it borrows as long as the city makes that determination no later than July 23rd, 
2020. The ordinance provides that the uh, mayor and common council prefer to amortize the debt service over an approximately 20 year term, which cannot exceed 21 years. The reason that the ordinance speaks in terms of approximately a 20 year term is because we are likely to close the bond issue in August of 2020, but the principal payment dates and the maturity dates under CDA's program are likely to be April 1 of each year. And so there won't necessarily be an exact 20 year amortization schedule. The uh, ordinance sets forth in five year increments, the maximum yield that any bond may bear based on its actual maturity date. Um, and while the expectation is that the city will be financing the entire project costs over a 20 year term, uh, CDA has not had its bond council, which does the tax diligence works for these deals, go through the tax diligence process yet. So if it finds that some components of the project do not qualify for a 20 year term based on useful life, when aggregated and looked at in whole, then the city may issue some bonds for less than a 20 year term based relating to this project. But the maximum of all bonds will not exceed $1,225,000. The substantially final form of any bonds is attached to the ordinances exhibit A and authority to approve and sign the final forms of the bonds is delegated to the mayor. The city will enter into a repayment agreement and a pledge agreement in the forms required by CDA and certain other standard closing documents. And the ordinance provides for the approval, execution, and delivery of those. The ordinance um, highlights that the city's ability to prepay the bonds is tied directly to the ability of CDA to prepay its own bonds. Because if the city at some point prepays the bonds, CDA will use that money to prepay a portion of CDA's outstanding bonds. Typically in the CDA program, there is a no call period for approximately 10 years from the date of issuance. In the ordinance, the city pledges its full faith and credit and unlimited taxing power to payment of the bonds and covenants to timely make debt service payments. The ordinance provides that the city agrees to provide certain information to the extent applicable that is mandated by SEC Rule 15C212, and that information would be provided to CDA. This, and it tends to be financial and operating data, including the city will have to submit its annual audited financial statements to CDA once they have been released. And this continuing disclosure requirement is while the city is not issuing is not directly subject to rule 15 c212 itself by issuance of the bonds cda is going to be subject to rule 15 c212 and the city may be treated as an obligated person with respect to cda's bonds under that sec rule uh, the, the ordinance provides that the city pledges state shared revenues to um, cover its requirements under the bond documents. This means that if the city were to default, CDA could direct the state treasurer to intercept any state shared revenues that would normally be transferred by the state to the city to CDA instead to cure such default. The ordinance sets forth certain tax representations and covenants because the bonds are intended to be, the interest on the bonds is intended to be exempt from federal income tax for purposes of the federal tax code. And finally, the ordinance recognizes that before its passage, the city, the common council will hold a public hearing on the ordinance. Uh, that public hearing has not yet been scheduled and Ms. Matthews will be coordinating that with you in the future. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Rader. Appreciate that and all the dire warnings, which 
none of which we uh, are confident are going to come to pass, but um, you have to give them to us anyway. We understand that. And of course, as I said to my colleagues, this is for introduction only tonight, in case this is the path that we ultimately decide to go down and the amount that we actually decide to eventually borrow. But for now, we needed to get the, um, the whole thing in motion. So that's why the um, ordinance is before you tonight. Is there, are there any questions or any discussion? Um, actually, we should start with the uh, actually start with the motion. Uh, may I have a motion for introduction? So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. Got a motion by Mr. Cavacci uh, for introduction and a second by Mr. Yingling. Uh, any discussion? All right. Thank you all very much. As, as I said, this is just for introduction, and will be back to us at least once, if not uh, more often than that, before um, we finally uh, make a decision on this. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The opinion of the chair, the ayes seem to have it, and the ayes have it. And uh, the ordinance is introduced. Ms. Rader, thanks again for joining us tonight. And we'll be back in touch as we need to be. Good evening. So moving on, uh, we will go to the unfinished business. There is no unfinished business of which I am aware. We have four items under new business. Um, first is approval of the HRI Incorporated Contract Change Order Number Three. Mr. Glass. Yes, sir. Um, I'm sure you'll recall back in early 2019 that the Mayor and Common Council awarded a construction contract to HRI for our work at the wastewater treatment plant for ENR in the biosolids project. Uh, to date, there have been uh, two approved change orders that total um, just over a million dollars to the contract with HRI. Uh, both change order number one, um, just as a reminder, was the um, enormous amount of overage for grout that was needed uh, due to some um, unstable soils and, and, uh, and sinkholes at, under the one structure. Um, and the other one, change order number two, was as a result of um, some requirements that the state uh, or MDE uh, provided for us um, with regard to um, the computer programming and uh, and coordination of, of all the uh, the, the uh, computer operated equipment that's on the site. So those were the the first two change orders that we have uh, before you tonight is change order number three, and this one will act to balance uh, some additions and credits to the project to date. Um, there are three items that are ads and two that are deducts. So I'll go over the ads first. Um, I'm sure you'll recall the uh, a um, um, earlier at a council meeting that there was a redesign from BG&E to uh, repower the, the new facility. And the cost of that redesign was uh, um, included in this change order at $94,474. Um, the second ad is a change in the support structure for elevated belt filter presses. That's uh, RFP number three at uh, $5,410. And then the, uh, the last ad is uh, replenishment of a grout budget uh, for um, unstable soils under reactor number five. If you recall, the uh, number one basically took all of the grout budget that we had for the entire project um, and that was um, uh, to substantiate uh, the nitrification <laughs> facility. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and so we are for sure that there will be some grout needed for this work under reactor five. And um, and this third ad will um, replenish that budget at four hundred. I'm sure. I'm sorry. Fourteen thousand eight hundred ninety-two dollars. Um, it should be noted that uh, um, the stream crossing for um, the BGNE work and um, et cetera was to be included in in change order number three. Um, I'm sorry, change order number two earlier, but but due to the sensitivity of the uh, and the timing and the execution of uh, change order number two, it was it was not included in number two and now is in change order number three. Um, so you would uh, there's a. Uh, uh, Attachments and memos to that um, to support that uh, that notion as well in the packet. Um, so there are two offsetting uh, reimbursement mm -hmm. items um, in change order number three that will be deducts. 
the first one is uh, PCR number eight. That's uh, um, is in relation to temporary power for $35,591.65. And, uh, and the second one then is uh, PCO number 11, that's for inspection over time in the amount of $1,650. So both of those will act as deducts. So um, taking all that into account, change order number three is an overall add for $77,534.35. Um, this change order is also subject to the state cost chair um, eligibility of 53.65%. Uh, and at this point, uh, staff would recommend that the Common Council authorize the mayor to execute change order number three in the amount of $77,534.35. And I'm pleased to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Glass. Uh, let's start off. May I have a motion to approve the um, contract change order number three? Motion to approve. Second. All right, that was a motion from, I think, Mr. Zingling and a second from Mr. Kavachi. Um, all those, uh, is there any further discussion or questions? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. So those opposed say nay. The ayes seem to have and the ayes have it and change order is approved. Thank you all very much. And now we'll move on to Number two, the second item, uh, approval for the fiscal year 2021 grant agreement between the city of Westminster and the world famous Westminster Municipal Band. Ms. Matthew. Thank you, President Pecorero. Um, the budget that the mayor and common council just adopted for fiscal year 2021 includes funding in the amount of $5,000 to support the activities of the Westminster Municipal Band. Um, as staff has recommended in prior years, um, we are uh, suggesting to the mayor and common council that you recognize this funding allocation through the execution of a grant agreement between the parties. Included in your uh, agenda packet is a proposed grant agreement between the city and the Westminster Municipal Band. This uh, proposed grant agreement outlines the terms and conditions of the grant funding for FY 2021. Um, I would note that the proposed grant agreement before you this evening is identical um, in most respects to the one that we have executed in prior years. Um, other than some date changes, the only other change um, is a recognition that um, the municipal band actually does not do um, have its financial statements audited. Um, that was language we had in previous agreements, but it doesn't recognize the fact that they're a small entity that doesn't get audits done. Um, so that change is reflected in uh, number four. The reference now is just to providing the city with a copy of its financial statement. Um, so at this juncture, um, staff does recommend that the Common Council uh, approve the grant agreement between the city and the Westminster Municipal Band in substantially the same form as included in your agenda packet um, and authorize its execution. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Matthews. You have before you the grant agreement, substantially same form, Matt, which, with what sounds to me like a very sensible uh, change. Um, any questions or comments or discussion before we move on to a vote? Hearing none, we will move on to a vote. All those in favor of approving the grant agreement with the Westminster Municipal Band signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Opinion of the chair, the ayes seem to have it and the ayes have it and the grant agreement is approved. Thank you all very much. Uh, next is the grant agreement with the Westminster um, Volunteer Fire Department. Ms. Matthews. Thank you. Uh, this is basically sort of a mirror image of what you just discussed, except in this case, um, the grant agreement is between the city and the Volunteer Fire Department. Um, as you all likely recall, the uh, FY 2021 budget allocates $250,000 in grant funding to support the activities of the Westminster Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, the grant agreement before you this evening is identical to the one that has been approved uh, last year, with the only exception being that the dates have been updated to reflect uh, FY 2021 instead of FY 2020. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. May I have a motion to approve the grant agreement? So moved, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Cavacci. Is there a second? I second that. And there's a second from Ms. Gilbert. Are there any questions or comments or discussion? 
Hearing none, we will move on to a vote. All those in favor of approving the grant agreement with the Westminster Volunteer Fire Department, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The ayes seem to have it and the ayes have it and the grant agreement is adopted. Last item of new business is a vote to go into a, a closed meeting. Um, we, somebody has a motion to go into a closed meeting at the conclusion of the regular meeting. Who would that be? Mr. I Mr. do, Mr. Mr. President. I've got it, Mr. President. Mr. Gawachi, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, under the statutory authority to close a section under the Maryland Annotated Code General Provisions Article 3-305B, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice on a legal matter and to consult with staff, consultants, and other individuals about pending or potential litigation and 305B-7 to discuss breach of contract matters. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Kavachi. Is there a second to the motion? I make a second. All right, there's been a motion by Mr. Kavachi and a second by Ms. Gilbert. Um, not objection. We will consider the motion agreed to. Is that that's all right? And we'll move and we will have a closed session at the end of the regular meeting. Thank you all very much. Departmental reports, Ms. Matthews. Thank you. I'll um, start with uh, Councilmember Dayhoff, who um, routinely gives the report on behalf of the Westminster Volunteer Fire Department. Thank you, Ms. Matthews. Um, the um, the chief's report for uh, for June. No, that would be the chief's report for May, dated June third, uh, indicates that uh, the total calls for the month of May were 454 calls. Uh, 407 of those calls were for uh, fire. Uh, no, 407 of those calls were for EMS. 47 of those calls were for fire. Uh, the vast majority of the calls were inside the city limits. Um, the one problematic statistic overlapping calls is still steady at around 53%. That is the number of times in which the medic unit is called out um, two or three uh, times and uh, we have to bring in Reese or New Windsor or uh, Pleasant Valley who do a great job for us, but um, that, that, that speaks to the volume that we have. Um, overall, um, the calls are a little down, and I guess that's uh, or the the call numbers are a little down. I guess that's reflective of uh, uh, the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, I think we're doing okay for um, for uh, protective equipment these days, but um, it's nip and tuck every other day um, to keep everybody safe and and to keep um, to keep running the calls. Uh, thank you, Ms. Matthews. Thank you, Councilmember Dayhoff. Um, we'll go next to Mr. Glass. Uh, yes, ma'am. Just wanted to report that um, the last week of May, we uh, we had our monthly pickup for brush and yard waste. Um, uh, things went um, relatively well. There were uh, large volumes that um, I think created a little bit of confusion where some residents thought that, uh, um, of course, they, they put their uh, material out as they um, we're told to do, and that worked quite well. The, our volume was just so large that we were not able to pick up everything in the first day. So I think there was a bit of confusion where people assumed that uh, that everything would be cleaned up in the first day, and and we were not able to do that. Um, but within a, um, the first three days, actually, we had everything done, and and it was uh, uh, back to normal again. Um, and then uh, the other thing to uh, to mention, I, I guess, is the uh, uh, Public Works had uh, had planned for a reopening. We had a plan put together, um, um, started that last week actually, and um, so when we're we're ready to uh, to discuss that, I think we'll have some some good information for you at that time. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Glass. Um, Ms. Gruber. I have no report this evening. Okay, uh, Ms. Child. I have no report this evening either, Ms. Matthews. Okay, uh, Chief Bloodwell. 
Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. So I think it's important for me to start off by letting you know that I believe that the actions of the former Minneapolis police officers were uh, deeply disturbing and unacceptable. And I think it's important for me to ensure you that the uh, treatment of Mr. Uh, George Floyd and the technique indifference that was used and displayed by those former officers are in no way consistent with our training and policy. I've received a number of correspondences from citizens um, with questions about our policies and how we do things here. And um, in reviewing uh, what we do have in place, I, I believe that most of the questions that were posed uh, were uh, already covered in our existing policies. Uh, there are important things I think relevant to this particular issue, um, including the duty of officers, even of a lower rank or seniority to intervene and stop excessive force when uh, viewed with uh, uh, fellow officers. So um, in addition to having that in our policies, I have gone around and met with our uh, officers. I have one uh, night shift group that I still need to meet with when I'm gonna work in the evening um, in a couple of days. But with the rest of them, we've had discussions about this incident and we've talked about um, our duty and what is right and uh, how to do our jobs professionally. So um, I do have confidence in this agency and in the women and men uh, employed here. But I, I thought that was important to um, uh, let you guys know that um, also, I have modified our command staff schedule to kind of for two reasons. One, uh, to split the, uh, the shifts for um, minimizing the amount of people with COVID-19 that we have in police headquarters at any given time, but also to ensure that we have command staff coverage of evenings and weekends um, with the in increase in uh, events to provide that coverage. So we have put that into place. Um, to touch quickly on uh, a subject that the mayor brought up um, in his initial comments. So uh, Captain Kowalczyk did um, have conversations with Miss Jessica Mills, who is the president of the parent high school, and they are working on the plans and also coordinating with the um, adjacent club at Winters Mill High School to uh, form a, a parade route for graduating seniors. And one of the initial ideas floated and, and she seems to be amenable to it is potentially having that route go between the two high schools. Uh, we would coordinate with the sheriff's office for areas outside of the city. And I think it would be uh, pretty easily arranged and doable to provide an escort and to um, block uh, some of the major intersections to have the procession go smoothly. So that is underway and it's scheduled for, or at least planned for Tuesday, June the 16th at 6 p.m. So um, that's the initial plan and that was the date and time on the application. So I wanted to uh, bring that up since I was muted when, when the topic was uh, brought up earlier. Um, additionally, we've done some things uh, going into phase two. Uh, we've split our detective schedule. So we have a day, a day shift and an evening shift. And, and taking some other actions to ensure that we're minimizing staff physically here at the office and continuing to uh, be able to do our jobs. Um, we're also on a positive note, since we're unable to do our annual uh, promotion and award ceremony in person this year, uh, we are working on the logistics and hopefully in the upcoming weeks, we'll be able to uh, present the awards and the promotions individually in our training room and broadcast it on um, Facebook Live. So that's the preliminary plan at this point, and we're working on the uh, specifics for that. Um, additionally, uh, I did reach out to both uh, the state's attorney and the sheriff and, and talked about some of the talking points with our policies. Um, one of the issues that's brought, that was that's being brought up um, as a common theme is, is uh, the issue of body-worn cameras for our officers. And I know um, uh, we were at various stages throughout the county of uh, discussions on this topic. Um, there are some logistics that have to be worked out uh, as far as discovery within the state's attorney's office, um, the ability or for staff to review and expunge um, segments of uh, footage and shield 
uh, redact segments that are, are required under a court order, things like that. Um, so I propose that we would um, start discussions as law enforcement leaders throughout the county, potentially to um, capitalize on economy of scale and synergy, synergy for these um, uh, logistics costs, staffing, uh, but at least to start the conversation and see where it goes. And, and they both seem amenable to headed in that, heading in that direction. So I believe that's what we're going to start talking about. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, I guess moving on to our Director of Community Planning and Development, Mr. Depow. Okay, the Historic District Commission met on Wednesday, June 3rd. They approved the facade improvement application for 143 West Main Street. That's the spa on West Main. We also introduced updated rules of procedure to the Historic District Commission. After we receive feedback from the HDC, we will send those to the city attorney for review, and then staff will bring the rules back to the HDC for a recommendation and forward the recommendations to the mayor and common council for action. Or on Wednesday, June 10th, the tree, tree commission will be discussing the 2020 urban and community forestry workshop. Uh, and it, in addition, discussing the 2020 Arbor Day celebration, uh, as you are aware, Due to the COVID-19, the city was unable to host the annual Arbor Day celebration this spring. In discussions with Maryland Department of Natural Resources, other communities have expressed interest in conducting a digital Arbor Day celebration. We're pushing it back till Saturday, October 24th, uh, which is a six month Arbor Day anniversary. So we are looking at the possible possibility of doing a digital Arbor Day celebration with staff only. Additionally, they will be reviewing the city comprehensive tree plan and discussing 2020 commission elections. On Thursday, June 11th, the Planning and Zoning Commission will hear the Mission Barbecue site plan. This is the redevelopment of the old Friendly's restaurant along Route 140 at the Route 140 Village Shopping Center. Also reviewing the big lots sign application and a 7-Eleven site plan, which is the redevelopment of the existing 7-Eleven convenience store, including the addition of gas pumps at the intersection of North Center Street and Route 140. And that completes my report. Thank you, Mr. Depot. Um, we have on the phone this evening, uh, Mr. Davidson, our technology manager. Mr. Davidson, is there anything you'd like to share this evening? I have no report, thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Pecker, I believe that uh, completes staff's reports unless there's any questions from the Mayor and Common Council. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, now this is the, uh, at the end of the meeting, it's time for citizen comments. Uh, this is the point where um, normally we would uh, invite the public to address us on any issues on tonight's agenda or other city issues. We're still working on a real-time solution to allow that. And we will continue to host these virtual meetings until we can return to City Hall. In the meantime, uh, we encourage people to uh, contact us uh, and share their comments with us by writing to us at comment at westgov.com. We did receive a few comments since the last meeting, which I will read um, to everybody. Uh, the first is from Morgan Hughes, team representative on behalf of the Westminster Stingrays board and team. It's come to our attention that there have been decisions made about the future of the pool. These decisions will affect the swim team greatly. The Westminster swim team is a nonprofit organization that has been a summer staple in the community for over 30 years. The team provides a healthy, fun summer activity for families in the community. Last year, our team had 193 members for safe lap swimming. We also provide a swimming lesson program to the community that taught 110 children to swim in 2019. Our team purchased 72 family memberships to the Westminster Municipal Pool, a requirement to be on the team. And we paid the city for the lifeguards and use of the community pool at the pool, which totaled $7,397.89 last year. We are saddened that the Central Maryland Swim Team, uh, Central, Maryland, Central Maryland Swim League, canceled the 2020 season, but we're hopeful that we could still offer practice for our athletes and perhaps swim lessons for kids in the community. We were surprised when the city council decided to close the pool before guidance for reopening was provided by the governor. 
We were excited, however, to learn that the city would be allocating money in fiscal year 21 to address much needed repairs to the facility. Wanted to make sure that in making these decisions, you and your staff are aware of the impact they will have on the ability of the Westminster swim team to operate. Some of these changes will incur costs that we, as not-for-profit teams, are not prepared to handle. We would like to bring some of these issues to your attention and ask that you consider them when making final decisions regarding construction. We also hope that you will plan to build additional funding in the budget to pay for these items. It is our understanding that the plan will shorten the pool to 25 yards and reduce the pool size by one lane. We will be one of only a few teams in the Central Maryland Swim League with a 25-yard pool. The standard for summer swimming is short course meters. This plan will have the following impacts on our team. One, requirement to retrofit our current lane from 25 meters to yards, which will incur costs. Purchase and reset new block anchors to an approved safe distance. These anchors were just reset last year as a shared cost by the city and the team. Confirm if the pool depth will change as a result of the construction. If the depth changes, we will need confirmation that the blocks which were purchased by the team last year at a cost of $16,853 meet the required standard for competition. The blocks were purchased after 10 years of special fundraising events. We do not have money to replace the blocks, which are required for membership in the Central Maryland Swim League. Reducing the pool to six lanes will require us to place additional limits on the number of swimmers on the team, thereby reducing family memberships purchase. With six lanes, um, with six lanes, we do not, sorry, with six lanes, the time will take to run a swim meet will lengthen requiring additional pool time and may interfere with regular openings to the community. The new team record board, all of our team records are currently kept in meters, which is the summer swim team standard. If the city does not open the pool this summer and the decision is finalized to begin renovation of the pool, we would like to know if the construction will be complete in time to start the next swim season. We anticipate that if the pool were to remain closed this year and not open on time next year, our families will make decisions to join other teams and the team will be resolved. As representative of a significant number of pool members and a community resource, we respectfully request to be informed of any plans for pool construction so that we can further communicate any concerns to the progress as the progress continues. For example, in the current rendering, a slide is depicted that appears to interfere with the location of starting block. Thank you for your time and consideration of our concern, and we look forward to working with the Parks and Recreation Department on plans for the pool improvements. Uh, Annette Myers, um, oh, sorry, that was it. Thank you. Uh, the next message is from Annette Myers at 72 Mar Hill Court, I believe. Pools are now lo- allowed to be open at 25%. Why did the city of Westminster close it for the season already? Seems a bit premature. Does the city not plan on making any revenue this year? Next comments are from Beverly Young, 940 Wampa Lane. Just some thoughts. Why can't the libraries open for pickups and drop-offs only? It is the slowest season of the year. Why can't the mall open for shopping only? Uh, gyms spread out, exercise and leave, question mark. And restaurants limited and spread out seating, question mark. All small businesses, employee temperature available, sanitizer for those walking in. Um, those, I think, are, oh, here's one more. Sandra Silverman. 1530 Indian Valley Terrace. I saw the article in the paper that the pool will probably not open at all this year, which is sad but understandable. Last year, I've seen a report on all the things that need to be fixed at the pool, so I hope you will use some of the money to do that so that this pool doesn't end up closed like the Tawny Town pool did. Young and old alike enjoy this pool, and they have very good attendance because I was a regular attendee too. It's the best way to get exercise and keep keep cool over the long, hot summers. I'm sad that no one can figure out a way to leave it open at least later in the year. Those are the comments I had. Thank you all very much uh, for uh, you know, sharing those uh, thoughts with us. We appreciate it. Uh, please continue to do so. And that's all we have on our agenda this evening. And so with that, I will close this meeting and we will reconvene in a few moments with the executive session. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening.